Minute and John, that's right. And joining me now is the beautiful Margaret McPherson, just looking so chic, Margaret. <laughs> and let's be honest though, yesterday you had some chemo yesterday and probably not feeling 100% today, not a little bit tired and that, yeah. so you're amazing for coming in and joining us for a special pink ribbon morning tea. Let's go back in time. I'm sure you can remember vividly the day that you were diagnosed. I can. It was um, October, self, self diagnosed well actually not a self diagnosis I found a lump myself, quite a large lump, and um, organised to have bilateral mammograms done myself, mm. um, because I actually work at the hospital. <laughs> so I, um, mm. but I rang and I went to my doctor and had uh, mammograms done and ultrasound and straight away there was warning bells ringing. Um, and then I went off to Bali for eight days. Nice. Because <laughs> they couldn't do anything, so so Bali. So I went to Bali anyway. Good on you. And then when I came back from Bali, I had the um, the core biopsies done, right. and that confirmed breast cancer. But I didn't know what type of breast cancer it was. It was just breast cancer. So I went to my doctor, and um, I had a friend went with me, and he said. You've got breast cancer, high grade, grade three, and so naturally you're you've got a, a death sentence hanging over your head because it's just human instinct to think, well, I'm going to die, and it's um, my whole world just sort of changed from then on, and your life does change from then on. I mean, I sort of felt like I fell into a big abyss and couldn't get out, and from then on. It, Everything changed from that that one day. I, even the waiting mm. to get a breast surgeon that went on for weeks. Um, and you you know you've got breast cancer, but you don't know how advanced it is, how and what um, how big it is. Mm. So with me working in the hospital too, I'm confronted buy it every day. And you want to grab one of those surgeons and say, oi, mate. And I also on, work in the part-time in the bone marrow transplant unit. Oh. So I was confronted with having that in my face every day as well, seeing the chemotherapy and what goes on. Um, so then when I finally did meet my breast surgeon, um, then I still had to wait another eight weeks for surgery. And the reason being is because she persuaded me with a bit of, um, to have a new technique done. Okay. And um, I'm the first one in Christchurch to have this technique done. Because most women, it's just a straight out mastectomy and they cut your breast off. Right. And it's quite disfiguring and there's no breast tissue to build up on. In my case, what I've had done um, is it's called a skin sparing reconstructive um, with a tiger mesh surgery, so I've had all my breast tissue cut out, but I've got my own skin on the outside and I have expanders in my breast, and it gets expanded through the course of time. And, the, and there was two reasons why I'd done it. Aesthetically, it was nicer, mm. and I thought, well, I'm a young woman, and I want to get into, and I want to get into relationships. And also I said to Josie, if I can help other women um, prove that they can have the surgery done without having their breasts cut off and then having to wait, because normally it's taken from your tummy or your back or whatever, right. whereas in my case it's all mine. Um, so I thought there was two options, was to help other women and to make it look nicer for me. So I've had a lot of comments on my breast because nobody realises that I've actually had a mastectomy but I still haven't finished the surgery though right? because um, they can't refinish it until I've had the radiation. So then I had surgery in December and, um, and then I started chemotherapy in February and um, yeah, it does change your life. Um, emotionally it's been a huge thing, a huge thing for me. I can I can cope with the physical scars, it's the emotional scars, and there's days where you're very very lonely, um, and you just sort of 
just want to climb back into bed and just don't want to do anything. And, but I've got a very good support group from friends and that helps me a bit. But I also lost my husband to cancer, so um, that has left a big void in my life and I was there for him, but I haven't got him there for me. No. So that's been a, extremely hard. Yeah. Those women that um, we saw at the start that will be told by their surgeon or their consultant that they have breast cancer, mm. what can you say to them? Be positive. Um, make sure you've got a lot of support. Support is very, very important. Um, yeah, I suppose, and join groups. Mm. And, and I think that's really important. And talk? And talk. Um, there's no breast cancer support group here in, in Christchurch at all. Um, so that needs to be addressed, I think, through the Cancer Society. Hugely. Mm. That's, that's quite frightening. Yeah. Well, um, we feel very privileged. Usually a control room is a bit noisy, things happening, but it's been silence for the last six and a half minutes just taking on your story. And just a little, very little gesture, but hopefully it can brighten up oh. some part of your home today. Oh, thank you very much. But thank you. Thank you. And, um, our thoughts are with you. Thank you. And you are just amazing. Such an incredible, incredible crew role model. Well, I so just want, well, can I just say that women who have breast cancer don't have to look like they've got breast cancer. And I've taken on this whole new look that you can look out there. Um, amazing, and because um, women, you get people perceive you to have cancer as down and out. And I said, no, I'm not going to. I'm not a cancer victim. I have cancer. And you are chic. Thank and you I'm so chic. much. You are chic. You are chic. <laughs> Thank you right very on. much. Now you're fine. Now stay with us after the break. Three wonderful friends, three wonderful ladies. We're here for some booby banter. Okay.